So we're here at the White House with Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor, to talk about the President's foreign policy, and specifically we want to talk about Cuba today, because Ben, you are the architect, is that fair? Architect? It's one word for it. One word for it. What's another word for it? Secret envoy? Yeah, it's, it's another word. It's another word. <laughs> That's two words for it. Uh, but you, you actually sort of pay, you were the pathfinder here, uh, the reopening of relations with Cuba. And I want to start here, and we could widen the aperture a bit, but talk about a moment, uh, it turns out to be a key moment. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but an encounter between the president and Raul Castro at uh, Nelson Mandela's funeral. Um, it, it struck me that, that that was a moment when things shifted a little bit in the perceptions each party had of, of the other. Yeah, well, uh, we had been in negotiations with the Cubans secretly for about six months at that time and hadn't really gotten These were in Canada. These, These were, were all in Canada at that point and hadn't really gotten anywhere with the Cubans. Um, I think in part because they have such a deep-rooted suspicion in the United States um, and they really weren't willing to put things on the table uh, like diplomatic relations and normalization that we ended up. What were you talking about with them? We were mainly talking about their desire to recover uh, several Cuban prisoners in the United States and Florida, the remaining members of the Cuban Five, um, and our desire to return Alan Gross to the United States. Alan Gross, the aid worker who was yes. captured. And we wanted a, a bigger package. We wanted to use uh, the exchange of some prisoners as an entry point to changing the relationship. Now, the president was going to uh, the funeral of Nelson Mandela, his personal hero. Um, and I remember on the plane to South Africa, you know, I raised with him, we had a list of the leaders who were going to be up on the dais where he'd be speaking. And one was Raul Castro. And I said, look, inevitably, uh, it is going to come up as to whether or not, you know, you shake his hand. These are the kinds of things. He had not to that date shaken either Castro's hand, Fidel or Raul, is that correct? That's right. Uh, they, at the UN or anything? At the, they had not come to the UN. Uh, at the Summit of the Americas, they don't attend that either. Um, uh, so never any, place where never any place where they've been the same place. Um, and he said, look, um, you know, the Cubans, given their history with Mandela, with the ANC, they have a place uh, at this event. Um, and I'm not going to essentially cause an uncomfortable situation for the Mandela family, for the South African people by snubbing the president of Cuba, who has a right to be on that dais. Um, what was the, I mean, when he was thinking that, what was the right that he was thinking of? Well, look, the, uh, whatever you think of the Cuban government, um, they supported the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, they fought side by side with the ANC. Uh, the Castros had a relationship with Mandela. Uh, and this is the president's hero, and he doesn't want to cause an incident at his memorial service um, by carrying forward this dispute between the United States and Cuba. Um, so he shook Raul Castro's hand, and I think if you look at the pictures, um, Castro is a little bit surprised by that. Uh, but what was interesting is in our subsequent meetings with the Cubans, the atmosphere changed a bit. Uh, and the first thing they said to me in the next meeting was uh, how much the president appreciated, President Castro, uh, that President Obama had done that. Um, and it, it kind of established a tone where they understood they were dealing with a different American president, one who was willing to uh, leave the history in the past uh, and uh, actually uh, try to get something done. You know, the small irony here is that the president, President Obama, is known as a cool, transactional kind of foreign policy president, but here you're saying that there was an actual kind of uh, personal connection moment, a, a sort of a, almost an emotional moment where the president of Cuba realized that this is more friendly than I thought. Is that... Well, what's interesting is that the emotion was on the Cuban side. You know, the Cubans uh, have so much built up, pent up history with the United States. Um, and in that one small gesture, uh, I think President Obama indicated that we can have discussions based upon a sense of mutual respect um, and that there's a place uh, for Cuba at an event like that, uh, the memorial service for Mandela. Uh, and again, that kind of opened up the space in our negotiations where they felt like they were dealing with a different American president. What, since we opened the door, let me walk, walk through it just for a moment. The president has an unusual understanding, unusual compared to previous presidents, let's say, uh, of American culpability in certain parts of the world. Indonesia, he's brought up with me, uh, obviously Iran and Mossadegh. Uh, it sounds as if you're saying that, that he almost in, endorse, endorses the 
the sort of Cuban help that was provided to the ANC in the 70s and 80s. Is that, is that fair or am I taking that well, too far? I think there, there's complexity to it. He doesn't endorse the political system of Cuba or the human rights practices of the Castro government. Um, but at the same time, he can see shades of gray in history. Uh, we had used the black and white version of history to justify a Cuba policy that didn't make much sense, that was far past its expiration date. Uh, I think he had enough of an understanding of history to know that uh, whatever we think about the Cuban government's uh, political system and human rights practices, uh, that in fact, uh, when it came to the anti-apartheid movement, uh, they had a place on that dais at Nelson Mandela's memorial service. Um, and he was not going to essentially disrespect the legacy of Nelson Mandela uh, by uh, carrying forward that history and snubbing the Cuban president because of our bilateral relationship. Give me, in, in, in broader terms, give me the theory of Obama's case on, on Cuba. Uh, we talk about in, in this article uh, that he has an unusual willingness to question the assumptions that go into bilateral relations with various countries. And the assumption that he was questioning in the Cuban relationship was why does it have to be this way? But what's the larger theory of the case, of the opening that he Obviously, I mean, it obviously pushed harder than the Cubans initially, at least. Yeah. Well, very quickly, I think there are three things. Uh, one is that America sometimes makes ourselves a prisoner of our own history. Uh, we have a very complicated history with Cuba. Uh, we've had significant historical differences with Cuba. Um, but that alone can't be the rationale for continuing a policy that's not working. That leads to the second point, which is he has a deeply pragmatic streak. If you just looked at our Cuba policy in isolation coming into office, it's not working. The embargo is not working. It's not doing anything except punishing the Cuban people. The Castro government is still firmly entrenched in power, and the Cuban people are suffering. And the third point is, you take those two facts, and you say, this is holding us back in the hemisphere in the world. Because of our history, because of our unwillingness to look at a failed policy and change course, we essentially have an anchor on American standing in Latin America, uh, and in some cases, in the rest of the world. And, and why not cut that anchor loose? An albatross. Yeah, yeah. And why not cut that loose and open up the door uh, to greater opportunities? I want to come back to that, but, but one, one of the things that you didn't mention was a notion, perhaps, that by opening Cuba, you'll change Cuba, uh, particularly on human rights issues and democratization issues. Is that not a priority of the president? It is absolutely a priority. And, and look, there are two openings here. One is to Cuba. Uh, and we believe that the Cuban people are suffering under the embargo, that the Cuban government is very comfortable in a situation where uh, we're just seeking to isolate them, pressure them, support a number of uh, actors inside of Cuba, but not uh, reach out to the whole Cuban people. By opening up travel, by opening up commerce, you're going to empower the Cuban people. They're going to get more resources. They're going to have more interconnectivity to the rest of the world. That, over time, has a greater chance of improving the human rights circumstance in Cuba uh, than this isolation and pressure that we've been applying. The second point is in Latin America. When we came into office, the wind was at the back of Hugo Chavez and Evo Morales uh, and the anti-American uh, forces. Movement. This album movement in Latin America, in part because we played to type. We played exactly into the type that they wanted, which is uh, the Americans coming and telling people who should run their countries, the Americans throwing their weight around in the region in ways uh, that fed this ideological dispute. By removing ourselves from that conversation, we remove a rationale for those anti-American leaders. Uh, and in fact, you've seen just in the last several months elections in Argentina in which uh, the anti-American president, Christina Kirchner, was replaced by a very pro-American president, President Macri, who will be visiting after Cuba. Uh, and you've seen Evo Morales uh, lose a referendum in, in Bolivia. I'm not saying there's a direct causal effect to our policies, but it is indisputable that we have removed ourselves, essentially, uh, as uh, a justifying force for those leaders in the region who have a politics that is rooted in anti-Americanism. Right. Stay on, stay on this for, for one more second, the, the, the human rights question. I mean, it's, a, there's a, it's an issue of great controversy at this moment, uh, shortly before this historic first trip uh, by the president to Cuba, about whether he's even going to see human rights dissidents, uh, political dissidents in, in Cuba. Can you give us a little bit of, yeah. of, of where the thinking is there? And would you be satisfied to go to Cuba and not meet political dissidents? Or are you strengthening inadvertently the hand of a, I think you, you make it plain, it's a single party state and it's a repressive system. Could, could you be inadvertently strengthening their hand if you don't push the human rights agenda more strongly? So first of all, we will see dissidents. Uh, we've made clear to the Cuban government, we see who we want to see in other countries. 
There's been pushback from the Cubans, though. Is that fair? Not on the president. Uh, no. You know, I think they know because we laid down the marker at the very beginning that we'd be seeing distance on this trip. But the second and more important point is uh, we utterly reject this notion that there's only one way to promote democracy and human rights. Uh, there is a, you know, a group of people, I think, in the United States who say the only way to demonstrate that you care about human rights in Cuba is to criticize the regime, isolate the regime, uh, and only try to engage with dissidents. We don't think that works. We care just as much about human rights and democracy as those people. But the fact of the matter is, we don't think doing something that's not working is a way to go about promoting democracy and human rights. We think we're going to be better positioned to do it through engagement. Uh, just one small example is having an embassy. This has been treated as some type of concession to have an embassy set up in Cuba. The fact is, having an embassy in Cuba allows us to have more contacts with the Cuban people, whether it's dissidents, civil society, entrepreneurs, and others. So we believe that this is a better way through engagement uh, of advancing the things that we care about. Frame this out in terms of, of Asia, because the, the, the theory applied to Asia doesn't seem to work so far in the following sense. We have massive business with China, obviously, but China is not a free country by any means. Vietnam is another example of a country that we've had. We've had very, very good commercial ties and political ties now, but there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that that, that exposure to American businesses, American tourists has, has loosened up the system. What, what makes you think that Cuba could be any different? Because the context is entirely different. Asia is thousands of miles away. Cuba is 90 miles from Florida. Uh, I've talked to Cuban Americans all the time, including Cuban Americans who supported the embargo for many years, and who will tell you, uh, whether it's a Carlos Gutierrez or a Mike Fernandez, significant figures in the Republican Party who said to me, look, uh, I supported the embargo. I thought it was the appropriate policy for a long time, but Cuba is going to change, uh, and we need to be a part of that change. And if we're not engaging Cuba, we won't be a part of that change. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, uh, if you have that level of commerce, that level of travel, that interconnectivity between the United States and Cuba, and between Cuban Americans and Cubans on the island, uh, I think it's going to be a much greater engage level of engagement than we would have with a China or a Vietnam that is uh, so far away from the United States, so culturally removed from the United States. I mean, it almost sounds, uh, and, I, and I know that you don't feel this way, but it almost sounds as if you're saying that, that Cuba will not be able to withstand the weight of American openness on their system. Meaning, when you have thousands of Americans staying in Airbnb properties in Cuba uh, and, 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 and internet access and Miami television coming in, that, that the system is inevitably going to change that way. Is that, is, that, is that fair to say that the president believes that over time, 5, 10, 15 years, we're going to see a very different Cuba because that, 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 that weight is going to be pressing down on, on the country? Well, look. Let me begin by saying we've made clear that we're not in this for regime change. We're not seeking to impose a new leadership on Cuba. We're not going to choose who the leaders of Cuba are. That's for the Cuban people to decide. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if Cuba is opening up, if you have that degree of interconnectivity, if Cubans can access more information, they will be in a much stronger position to make decisions about their own future. Uh, they will have much greater control over their own livelihoods if there's increased commerce, if there's increased entrepreneurship in Cuba. Um, so yes, we do believe that as this opens up and as you have greater access to information, greater access to travel, greater access to the international community, to the United States, uh, the Cuban people are going to be in a better position to determine their own future. Do you, do you believe that the Miami Cubans will come back into play as a powerful force in Havana? And is that something that you want? Well, what's interesting is I think there's been an evolution among many of the Miami Cubans which again, I think it used to be kind of viewed through a zero-sum window. Uh, either the casters are running Cuba, uh, or there are certain people in Miami who are, are waiting to go back and, and run, run Cuba. Cuba. I don't mean to you know, uh, give it such a short uh, uh, hook, but I think that was kind of the binary view of some uh, in this uh, situation. I think what you're seeing now is there's a recognition in both Cuba and in the Cuban-American community, including in Miami, that Cuba is changing. Uh, Raul Castro has set in motion a series of reforms that are evolving the economic model. There's going to be a political transition. Raul Castro has said he's going to leave power. Um, and that there's an acceptance that this can be evolutionary change, uh, that it need not be uh, the type of regime change effort that the United States uh, would have supported in the past, but rather if you have 
uh, Cuban Americans who are getting more engaged uh, in the affairs of the island and the economy of the island, who are rebuilding bridges to their own families and friends on the island, that ultimately that is going to help uh, serve for a more stable uh, evolution of Cuba uh, that is going to improve the lives of the Cuban people and ultimately, I think, reconcile the Cuban American community uh, with, uh, so this with is the third island. Way, you think? I think it's a third way, absolutely. Let me ask you one very specific question uh, on Cuba. It's specific, but I think it concerns a lot of Americans, um, which is, uh, it's the flip side of this, the fear that the inundation of American business, um, uh, the, 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 the fear that the flood of money and tourists will actually change Cuba, make it more like the rest of the Caribbean, where you're gonna have in five years McDonald's and the squares of uh, old Havana. Is that something that you've picked up from the Cuban side is of great concern to them? I mean, what are they, what are they doing to try to manage that process? And is it actually a care of the administration or does this administration say, great, more American businesses, the better? Well, you know, I think, first of all, there is something unique about Cuba that is informed by history, but also informed by the, the nature of the place that has captured the imagination of the American people in well, the world. Yes. I mean, on a very practical level, I think the Cubans have plans to try to preserve um, their heritage, to preserve Old Havana, to try to develop incrementally in, when it comes to their tourism sector in a way that uh, doesn't transform the island into just another tourist destination. Um, so part of that is just going to be a, how do they manage development. But another piece of this, and this is very important, as we've been talking to American companies and as we've been thinking about our own policy changes, we very much want to encourage industries other than just the travel industry to get engaged in Cuba. Our technology and telecommunications companies uh, to help bring uh, advanced technology and access to information to Cuba. So Alan Gross was just five years too early. Well, but, and here's the important thing about Alan Gross, and I think Alan himself uh, would probably subscribe to this view. This is a good example of why what we're doing doesn't make sense. We used to have a policy where we have embargo in place, and then we try to bring cell phones into Cuba. And we try to bring printers into Cuba uh, and give those to dissidents. What's a more efficient way of promoting access to information? Uh, shipping a bunch of cell phones uh, to Cuba and computers to Cuba and trying to hand them out to people uh, surreptitiously? Or just lifting restrictions <laughs> so that cell phone technology can go to Cuba, cell phones go to Cuba? If you want to connect Cuba, lift the embargo. Don't try to you know, smuggle some phones down there and hand them out. Let me, um, let me pivot to the Middle East. Um, if I, that was a joke, by the way. You can laugh at that. Um, it's sort of an inside joke. Um, but if you read the piece, you'll understand what the joke is. Um, the, um, let, let, let's pivot to the Middle East, but apply what we're talking about to a Middle East situation. My, my theory of the case, you don't have to describe to it, um, is that Burma was in some way practice for Cuba, opening up a closed society. So the, the question is, is what you're doing in Cuba, do you think it has any relevance to America's relationship with Iran, which is obviously a whole other category of traditional adversary? Um, is, there, is, there, is there lessons that can be applied to that, or is that just Pollyanna-ish thinking? Well, there are two things. You know, one is, one commonality between the Iran deal and the Cuba opening is, in the president's judgment, the approach we were taking wasn't working. Iran was advancing its nuclear capability. Uh, the Cuban regime was uh, firmly in power. Um, and we can test whether another approach works without giving anything up. Um, with respect to the Iranian nuclear deal, uh, we were able to test whether Iran can comply with this deal over uh, an extended period of time. And if they don't, we can reimpose our sanctions. We give up none of our capabilities. Just as with Cuba, uh, we're not giving anything up by having an embassy, by having diplomatic relations, um, and, and we can test uh, whether that is a better policy over yeah, time. But, but, but in the meantime, though, it's fair to say that the Iranian regime is less on its back foot right now because the money that's been released, I mean, it's their money, but it was frozen in our accounts. The money has helped buttress that regime. And you could argue it depends on which Cuban state industries benefit from this, but you might be buttressing the regime in Cuba as well. I mean, it's not, you, you, well, you, you maintain ultimately, you maintain your ultimate military capabilities, but your economic leverage is less today over Iran than it was a year and a half ago, two years ago, when the sanctions were really crippling their economy, no? Well, with respect to Cuba, again, I think they've found ways to survive in very difficult economic circumstances. So we don't think economic pressure was 
a driver of political change there. With respect to Iran, they get that sanctions relief if they abide by the terms of the deal. And we think that that's a good deal for us. And Iran, without a nuclear weapon, we can verify they're not getting a nuclear weapon, it's worth giving them that sanctions relief. But we can turn it back on, the sanctions, if they violate uh, the deal. You know, the, set, the difference, important difference with Cuba is the Cubans took a, a leap in reestablishing diplomatic relations with us and saying that they were going to normalize relations. They had existed in an anti-American space where they justified their regime in some ways in opposition to the United States. They're now doing something very different. A pillar of the regime was anti-Americanism. Yeah, and there still is a degree of anti-Americanism, but it's obviously not the same level it was. The Iranians have not made that choice. Uh, the Iranians have not pursued true normalization with the United States. Um, so this is still... It remains one of the fundamental pillars of yeah. their existence. Yes, you know, and so, you know, yes, they made this deal with us on nuclear weapons, uh, and we were able to reach a resolution that some Americans detained there, but it was not accompanied by a broader shared objective of normalization like we've had with Cuba. Uh, so we're, I would say the, uh, the engagement with Iran is not as evolved as the engagement with Cuba, in large part because the Iranians uh, have not taken that decision, uh, and you continue to see hardline elements in Iran who are firmly uh, entrenched and opposed to that type this of This is one of the critiques of the Iran deal is that, that the hardliners have entrenched themselves in some ways. And even this election, in, in which you could argue that the moderates who are allowed to run were actually just less hardline than the other hardliners, that, that, that the regime made sure that no true moderates were running, uh, that, that worked out in favor of the people. But they're, they're, all this has done is buttressed the, 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 the hardline factions. And uh, to, what degree, to what degree is this criticism just political criticism, and what degree is there some, some so, salience yeah, to where, it? Where I take issue with that is all of our indications are that the hardline elements did not support the nuclear deal, were concerned about the nuclear deal, uh, and in fact, they have not been strengthened by the nuclear deal. If anything, the election recently, while it's not transformative, uh, indicates that they're on the back foot inside of Iran. Um, and this gets at how do we think about how our policies interact with what's happening in these countries. Um, I believe that the opening to Cuba is, over time, going to strengthen people in Cuba who want to have a different type of relationship with the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, and the question is, uh, are the policies we're pursuing vis-a-vis -vis Iran, uh, are those reinforcing the hardliners and putting them in a stronger position? Or uh, is it creating a space, potentially, uh, for uh, more moderate forces in Iran to assert themselves? Uh, and that's going to play out over time, but you know, our judgment is that the hardliners uh, were not supportive of the nuclear deal and have not been strengthened by it. One of, the, one of the, the frames I use in this, in this piece uh, is something I borrowed from Derek Chalet, who's a former National Security Council uh, official, um, who, who talks about the president as, as not a bluffer, but a gambler, uh, which I think is a very interesting way of, of, of understanding him. And so l let me just stay on Iran for one second, although you could apply this to Cuba as well, I suppose. Uh, how much of a gamble has this been? I mean, if we lose the bet, what, what are the consequences of losing the bet we've made that we could denuclearize Iran? It's a good question. I mean, I think that um, the, you know, the practical consequences are it will, um, you know, number one, we'd have to essentially go about reimposing the sanctions and putting Iran back in a hole, uh, and then we'd be uh, confronted with the same choices that we were facing in 2011, 2012, about whether to take military action uh, or pursue some other course. In that regard, I think the president feels he can make the bet without giving up his trump card, which is we continue to have military option. Um, in terms of uh, broader consequences, look, part of what we're trying to demonstrate in Iran is you can resolve these types of issues, these types of security issues, nonproliferation issues through diplomacy. Um, and when diplomacy doesn't work, um, you know, I think that ultimately it may make it harder to do that type of agreement in the future. Um, but again, uh, we... If, if, if the country plays another Trump card. It, yes. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, though, we, you know, people who wanted to use military action against the Iranian program, or in our judgment is, and we had this debate at length last summer, if you're against a diplomatic resolution, there's really no other course that can prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. The same military option we had in 2012 will exist 
in some future date if they violate the deal. And in fact, our own military capabilities continue to advance. So um, while it's a, a, a gamble in some respects to see if Iran will comply, um, we maintain um, our strongest cards uh, when it comes to uh, having a military option as a, as a backdrop. So one other issue about the Middle East. One, one of the things that's so interesting about this president is that on the question of Iran, he questioned the underlying assumption. Why, why do we have to have this, rela this dysfunctional relationship with, with this country? Um, one of the other things he does that's interesting, and this is my judgment, not yours, but, but my judgment is that he has also, on occasion, questioned the underlying assumptions of friendships that we have particularly in the Middle East, but, but perhaps elsewhere. Um, and, and one of the interesting things that he said to me in the course of these interviews is that, is that the two main powers in the Muslim Middle East, Iran and Saudi Arabia, are gonna have to figure out a modus vivendi. They're gonna have to figure out a way to share, uh, share the space. Um, and that has caused a lot of sort of at least emotional destabilization. Maybe it hasn't caused actual destabilization yet. But, but go into that a, a little bit, uh, and you could attack the premise, if you want, that, that he has questioned some of the, some of the under, underlying assumptions of these friendships. But to an uncanny degree, to a really unusual degree, I think he has asked the question of, a, why do we sort of blindly follow these people who are allies? And B, how important are these relationships to us as we move toward what he thinks of as an Asian century? Well, I think the way to think about this is we have commitments to our allies uh, in the region, uh, including the Gulf states. Um, if Iran is engaged, but here's what we discussed with them at Camp David and I think has played out over a number of years. If Iran is threatening them, through provocative action, you know, through cyber attacks or attacks into their territory or destabilizing activities in the region, we will work with them to uh, confront that type of behavior. But we cannot help them prevail in a sectarian conflict across the region. Um, and if you think about this, this also gets to, I think, the present questioning the assumption as to what can we do with our own military power? I went to Iraq in 2006, I remember, uh, when you know, it was one of the highest levels of fighting in the country. Uh, and a lot of that fighting was sectarian militias fighting each other. We had 150,000 uh, troops in Iraq uh, uh, at, at its peak. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, uh, there was still a sectarian war taking place underneath that presence. Um, and now you see a sectarian conflict playing out in Syria. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, I think the president has been very wary of putting American forces into the middle of that type of sectarian conflict. And what he's essentially saying is, we can be a guarantor of your security and your sovereignty, but we cannot tip the scales in a sectarian conflict across this whole region, uh, because frankly, any war rooted in religion or sect um, is not a winnable war, uh, because there are people <laughs> in different places who are Shia and who are Sunni, uh, and that there has to be a way in which people can live together and reach some political accommodation, rather than Not having- Not winnable for us, but winnable for- Winnable for anybody, anybody. right? Um, that, that there has to be a political accommodation among these groups, that nobody is going to win a proxy war in the Middle East. You might win for a, time, a period of time in one place, uh, but if this is festering across the region, it's gonna pop up somewhere else. And that's what we've been seeing in recent years is uh, extensions of Different sectarian. Conflicts. Do you think that the, the United States has been enabling these allies to pursue these adventurous policies, adventurous but destructive policies? No, you know, I think what's happened is you've seen uh, the momentum of these sectarian conflicts take on a life of their own, um, and the logic in the region has been escalatory. So I think our friends can rightly say, "Well, look, the Iranians are." Uh, you know, they are engaged in destabilizing actions in Yemen, so we need to go into Yemen. Or they are engaged in destabilizing actions in Iraq, and so the Sunnis have a right to be disaffected. Uh, or uh, they are supporting a minority Alawite regime that has lost uh, the support of its people, and so we have a right to support this opposition. And in, in each kind of case, you can make the argument uh, that yes, uh, the Iranians are engaged in destabilizing behavior and we need to confront it. But I think taken as a whole, the point is you cannot continue to feed this brush fire of sectarian conflict and expect that 
uh, to lead to anything except more conflict across the region. Um, and you've seen this in Lebanon, uh, that ultimately there has to be some political accommodation. Uh, people need to learn how to live together in this part of the world. Does he think that the, that the U.S. has the capability of making people live together or, or, or guiding these conflicts, or is this beyond our... We don't have the capability to force outcomes on people in the Middle East, and I think this is something that... Is that unique to the Middle East, or is that a, is that a position he holds about most regions of the world? Well, I, I mean, there's no other uh, part of the world that is quite so inflamed at the moment. Um, I, you know, I do think the way I would characterize it is we can't impose solutions, but we can incentivize solutions. We can incentivize better behavior. We can incentivize uh, political uh, accommodations, and that's what we've been trying to do um, very hard in Syria in, in recent months. Um, I do think, and this is a, a, a disconnect with, I think, elements of the establishment view in, in Washington as it relates to foreign policy. Uh, I think there's a sense that we can here in Washington that you know, we can engineer these outcomes. And if we, you know, if we kind of piece together the, the puzzle in a certain way, we can make a country look like this. Um, and I think this all gets at what lesson do you draw from the experience of Iraq? You know, do you draw the lesson that, you know, uh, if we had more troops at, at the beginning, it would have been better, or the surge, if it had just continued for more years, everything would have worked out better? Or do you essentially say, the United States spent a trillion dollars in a country and had well over 100,000 troops there for nearly a decade, and we still couldn't piece together uh, a stable political culture in that country. We have to recognize that there are limits uh, to what we can do in these places. And the president is trying to identify, recognize those limits, and then try to find the policy tools to protect the American people from threats like terrorism uh, and to try to create more stable outcomes over time. The, uh, go to this question of the establishment, because I, I, I bring it up prominently in this piece. Uh, because I think he, he, he thinks about this a lot. Is his problem with the foreign policy establishment, or the national security establishment in Washington, that it's over-militarized in its thinking, or that we in Washington and America believe that we can shape outcomes that we can't shape? What, what, is it that, what is it that bugs him so much? Well, it's both. I think that the militarization is a key point. Uh, and the notion is that to show uh, seriousness about how much you care about a situation, you can only show that seriousness through the use of force. Uh, and that there is not wired into the establishment a process by which you think through what happens the day after. You know, something is happening, we have to respond. Um, but when you're actually president, you have to think through, okay, if I launch this airstrike or send these troops into this country, what happens the day after and the day after that? How am I going to sustain the support of the American people? How am I going to resource this? Isn't that also a recipe for doing nothing? Because everything has a second or third order consequence. It's not a recipe for doing nothing because he does engage in force when he thinks there's a direct threat to the United States. He's used force against terrorist networks in many countries. That's necessary. But it's these types of military interventions that are designed to determine the futures of countries, uh, the future governance of countries, uh, to engage in regime change and replace it with something else those are, I think, the types of military engagements that the president thinks we need to think harder about than we have uh, in recent years. And I think the second point here uh, is that everything is viewed through the prism of us. That, and this does get back to your question about Indonesia and other places the president has, has lived in and experienced. We're so vain, we probably think the world is about We think that everything that is happening in every other country is about us. Um, and in fact, m most of what is happening around the world is, tends to be about conflicts that are local or regional, where we are a player because we're the world's superpower, but we should be using our status as the world's superpower to build international solutions um, and, and not to think that we just have to go in every different place um, and create the solution ourselves. I'm mad at myself that I didn't use the Carly Simon doctrine as a, as a title for something. Uh, I reject that doctrine. Are you rejecting? Yeah, I reject the Simon doctrine. Do, do you accept the James Taylor doctrine? That's a very important question. Yeah. Still, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not quite there. We're going to leave that one. Uh, that was John Kerry's doctrine. Yeah. Uh, the uh, one final thing, uh, and this is sort of a big one, we call this uh, piece the Obama doctrine. Uh, this, two questions, I guess they're interrelated questions for you. Uh, I know what I think of as the Obama doctrine. I want to know what you think is the Obama doctrine, and I also want to know if you think that there is such a thing as an Obama doctrine. Yeah. Well, look, um, 
This question is often viewed through the prism of uh, when do you use force? And you know, doctrine has been tied to the use of force in the past. Um, and this whole question got raised uh, by the very provocative Bush doctrine of saying that we'll use force preemptively to prevent countries from getting weapons of mass destruction. Now, first of all, we felt that that was an overly broad doctrine. And in fact, it was only applied in Iraq. It wasn't applied in North Korea, which acquired nuclear weapons under the Bush administration. So you have to be careful that you're actually going to meet the doctrine you set. With the use of force, I think the doctrine that the president has is that if there is a direct threat to the United States, we will use force against that threat, and we'll do it alone if necessary. And right now, the direct threat that could kill Americans, take American lives, is terrorism. And he uses force very aggressively against terrorism, uh, whether it's in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Somalia uh, or Yemen or Libya. Uh, time and again, or Syria and Iraq, he has demonstrated that he will use force um, uh, against terrorist networks. What he uh, won't do is apply that same prism of potentially using force unilaterally um, in circumstances that don't directly implicate American national security. Uh, if it is a threat to global security, if it is a humanitarian challenge, he believes uh, that we need to act internationally, we need to act as an international community and as a leader of the international community. So he, that's how he disaggregates uh, a terrorist network. Uh, and importantly, I think how he would disaggregate ISIL from Assad. Assad is a threat to the regional order, and that's why we've taken a number of measures against Assad and believe he's lost legitimacy. Um, but but ISIL, he doesn't pose a direct national security threat himself. He's not trying to attack America. ISIL is, and so we're bombing ISIL. Um, uh, so that's how I think we look at, uh, at that. Um, isn't ISIL, though, a byproduct? I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but isn't ISIL in part a byproduct of the Assad regime? The existence of the Assad regime promoted inadvertently the, yes. the rise of ISIL? Yes. Um, so did uh, Nouri al-Maliki's uh, you know, marginalization of the Sunni population. So has the instability in Mali created an opening for AQIM. Uh, so has the vacuum in Libya uh, created uh, so opening stress. My, my point is, yeah, if you, if you said everything that is a second order a cause of terrorism therefore has to be uh, a target of military action, uh, that leads you down many different uh, roads. The second thing I'd say is, uh, then what is a perception of American leadership uh, beyond just this question of using military force? Uh, and I think it's very much the president's view, um, and this doesn't always fit on a bumper sticker, that American leadership essentially has to shape the international environment in which all of these issues are addressed. We need to be setting rules of the road uh, so that it's clear how nations trade with one another, how nations govern cyberspace, uh, how nations resolve territorial disputes uh, in the South China Sea, that we are using our muscle, our economic influence, our diplomacy to create an international order with clear rules uh, of the road. And in doing so, we need to engage broadly. We need to engage allies, but we also have to be willing uh, to engage traditional adversaries as well. Uh, and that's, I think, what he's applied to uh, challenges as diverse as climate change or TPP or the Iran nuclear deal. What is the common thread between those three key Obama legacy items? The common thread is they depended on an international order. Uh, with Iran, you needed the P5 plus one and a sanctions regime and an investment in the non-proliferation treaty to create the basis for that outcome. With Paris, you needed to invest nearly 200 countries uh, in a process by which they're making commitments to address climate change. They're reviewing them every five years transparently uh, and have the ability to revise those targets. And with TPP, uh, you're taking 40% of the global economy and establishing a set of rules for them. So there is a common thread to how he is addressing these very different problems. And the thread is that the United States is at the center uh, of an international community that is establishing rules uh, on how we're going to uh, deal with problems in the 21st century. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff.